Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Bartlett, for such a nice introduction. And um, thanks, everyone, for coming. I have a few more copies of a paper here if you're uh, interested up here, uh, either now or later. And um, so I, I do want to thank the Qualitative Research Methods Group uh, for inviting me here and the Wisconsin Center for Education Research for uh, funding my visit here to uh, the University of Wisconsin. You know, I also just want to say that um, uh, I'm honored to be here on, on a couple of different levels personally. Um, it's, a, it's a special visit for me because um, I was born here. I was born in University Hospital uh, and, um, and then uh, lived here for several years. I went to Montessori school here and then my mother went on to be a Montessori school teacher uh, later on in Massachusetts where I grew up. Uh, and my dad was on the faculty here in sociology back in the 60s. So that would be, is that that way? Yeah, social science is that way. Um, and so that's, that's one level. The other level of that is that um, I've always had huge respect uh, for uh, the work that goes on uh, in the School of Education here at the University of Wisconsin. And um, so that's another reason why I'm so honored to be here with you today. And um, I also am aware of the uncertain future um, that the, the university faces. And um, I just want you to know that I'm, I'm aware of Act 55. Um, also, I hope you know that um, we at your sister institution uh, to the Northwest, <laughs> University of Minnesota, um, we're with you on this, <laughs> all right? Okay, so to get into this, uh, to this project, one of the things I want to say at the very beginning is that um, I just recently concluded uh, data collection on this project, and it was uh, uh, the larger project on um, school improvement, cultures of school improvement, leadership, distributive leadership. Um, that stretched out over a period of about four years. Uh, the grounded grit part of this has been over the last two years. And so I'm very much in the middle of data analysis and interpretation, and I'm very interested in any comments or questions or suggestions that you might have um, for how to make sense of um, uh, the voices and experiences of these, uh, these people that I'm going to be sharing with you today. So um, make sure that we'll, we allow uh, time for that. So many of you have probably heard about um, the, the recent uptick in conversations about non-cognitive factors associated with academic success. Conversations, discussions, discourses on things like grit, perseverance, academic mindsets, um, the beliefs that uh, hard work leads to um, success, um, these kinds of things. As you might know, most of this literature comes out of psychology and social psychology. And I thought it would be quite interesting to, to undertake a study that tries to understand how young people acquire these academic mindsets actually in situ, on the ground, all right? Um, through the everyday creative efforts and commitments of teachers and school leaders, as well as parents and community members. So that was a big motivation for me. Um, and so I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, you also see that I'm situating this um, in a neoliberal frame. And uh, Dr. Bartlett and I just came from the uh, American Anthropological Association meetings where certain faculty members were pushing for very precise definitions of neoliberalism, right? Because it does get thrown around a little bit, all right? So, okay, here's uh, a couple things that I've used in the past. Um, so just the differences between liberalism and neoliberalism, okay? So you can see liberalism, the classic definition here, freeing individuals from constraints of things like hereditary status, established religion, absolute monarch monarchy, right? But look at the definition of neoliberalism, right? So freeing individual entrepreneurial efforts, right? Uh, and the powers of finance more generally from the constraints of state oversight, okay? And I think that's a helpful way to be very clear about where the term neoliberalism comes from. And uh, just to go a little deeper here, a couple of um, quotes from David Harvey's book. This is a brief history of neoliberalism. Um, again, look at the top, this, this, uh, this tenet that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms, okay? And private property rights, okay? Um, and then secondly, that indeed Harvey says that neoliberalism, neoliberalism, neoliberalism <laughs> seeks to bring all human act activity into the dom domain of the market, right? Um, and that everything in principle then can be treated as a commodity. So one of my concerns here is how uh, young people in a more disadvantaged uh, area uh, in the Twin Cities metro to the northwest of here 
um, how they make sense of this terrain, how they make sense of the futures that lie ahead of them. All right, so that's where we're going to go. And just to go back to, into how I'm thinking about this and how this is linked to some of my long-term uh, concerns and interests as a scholar. Uh, so Leslie showed you uh, very graciously the, the book that I wrote a, uh, several years ago based on a really a study of how educational advancement is constructed in a suburb of uh, Columbus, Ohio, back when I was on the faculty at Ohio State. A little background on this. One of the things that I did um, after that book is I uh, was invited to be a part of a workshop uh, in an anthropology department on the social life of achievement. And some of you might know the work of Signithia Fordham. Signithia Fordham has done a lot of important work on race and achievement and identity. She's at the University of Rochester there, and she was on at the same workshop. And after I gave a presentation, uh, she said, I'm so glad that you're writing against achievement as an individual act writing against achievement as an individual act. And I think uh, that's extremely important for many of us today that, are, that see ourselves as equity-minded educators and researchers. And so that book is really about this whole um, cultural, sociocultural apparatus, this local logic, a system of beliefs and practices that support the academic achievement and personal advancement of individual students. All right, so there are all kinds of aspects of this whole cultural system that um, really make it look like these achievements are the products of individual efforts, but there is so much that underlies these individual outcomes, okay? And so, you know, there's a whole ideology here that actually had a name, a class cultural ideology. Um, the institution was behind uh, young people in certain ways. I'll talk about that a little later. Um, young people had these specific strategies uh, for kind of getting ahead, um, and self-advocacy was huge there. The role of parents um, and how this is normalized, it was expected that parents would play a key role. Uh, but I want to focus a little bit over here in this uh, corner here, the, how the very identities that students seem to be taking on seems oriented towards success and achievement. And so what I did there is I took a notion that, and um, this goes back to what Dr. Bartlett just mentioned as far as interpreting data, um, I saw um, a conceptualization of psychological capital in some of Sherry Ortner's work. And she had talked about this a bit, um, but I thought that might be something that I can elaborate a little bit, because these seem to be um, identity components that young people are aware have market value, right? And we all know that this is um, central to Bourdieu's theory of capital, right? And so these are some of the components of psychological capital that I saw there. And indeed, in many ways, these are adaptations to a neoliberal regime. Especially look at um, the attachments to individual success here, and also precociously circumscribed aspirations. What I mean there is that these young people, even in ninth grade, in this suburb had strikingly precise ideas about they wanted their future lives to be like. Um, I think this is what Anthony Giddens was thinking about when he talked about um, the importance of colonizing the future, right, in a neoliberal era, colonizing the future. Um, and that's very, very important. So hang on to the, um, this future orientation because that's very, very, very important here. So, um, just to tell you a little bit about this, uh, the present study that I want to talk a little bit about today. So this is, um, this was based in a school and community um, that is uh, primarily uh, serves, you can see the, the number of the student demographics here. Uh, you can see the number of students eligible for free and reduced young lunch. Um, it is, it could be characterized as a, a disadvantaged part of the Twin Cities metro area, all right? It's the largest Title I grade 9 to 12 uh, high school in the state of Minnesota, all right? So you can see a bit of the, the breakdown there. And this is how um, I went about designing this part of the study. So I had been doing field work in this school for two years previous to starting this study, uh, interviewing teachers, teachers, leaders on leadership capacity, building school improvement efforts in the school as part of my role of as an evaluator of a large US DOE funded turnaround project. <coughs> but then specifically for this, what I did is I 
um, worked with teachers at the school to identify a diverse group of higher and underachieving students, um, mainly juniors, some seniors as well, interviewed them, and then the juniors, I followed them into their senior year and interviewed them again during their senior year. I also asked these young people to identify staff members that had been helpful to them in acquiring some of these non-cognitive factors. And then my research assistant and I, and I want to thank Sarah Kemper at the University of Minnesota for working with me on this project. Um, we attended classes taught by those teachers. Uh, if they were guidance counselors, we went and sat in on sessions with students. Um, and then we interviewed those teachers as well. All right. And so you can see the, uh, the numbers of uh, the field notes, all this, and school documents as well. Um, so that was uh, just to give you a sense of the data sources here. So I want to talk uh, today about um, the experiences of three different focal students. Um, there were a, a total of eight focal students in the study. I'd like to focus on three of them uh, with you here today because their experiences um, illuminate uh, quite starkly certain aspects of developing this sense of neoliberal agency um, that I think many of us here are interested in and concerned about and want to understand better. So, um, Pajau Yang, um, her parents uh, came over to uh, the United States in, uh, in the 1980s from a refugee camp in Thailand. They're originally from Laos. Um, her maternal grandmother was a huge source of uh, inspiration and guidance uh, for her. She passed away in 2013. Um, Pajau actually became pregnant in her freshman year of high school. Um, she endured substantial ridicule from her peers and from her friends, uh, from her classmates. Um, and now what she is doing is she is raising her child with her uh, Hmong cultural husband as well as her parents. Later on in her high school career, she became secretary of the Jefferson High School Student Council. So that's Pajau Yang. We'll talk about her a bit more in, in a minute. Now, Nimo Yusuf, um, her parents were from the borderlands between Somalia and Kenya, northwest Kenya, far north Northeast Kenya. Um, she admitted in my first interview uh, with her that she was not a serious student in middle school. She regularly talked back to teachers. She regularly talked back to her parents. Um, in response, her parents sent her back to Somalia um, to spend time with her relatives and to spend time with her family there to hopefully become more serious about her studies and hopefully become more serious about her future. But what happened is when she was visiting um, her father's mother uh, in a very uh, far-flung part of the borderlands, um, that particular hamlet uh, was attacked by members of al-Shabaab uh, who had heard that there was an American young person uh, visiting there and she was held at gunpoint while her female relatives were assaulted. Um, she came back to the U.S. after that um, and another thing that happened uh, several months later is her mother um, left home uh, without giving family, the family notification of her, the reason for her leaving, and Nemo was left to look after um, her eight siblings and half-siblings. She was the oldest um, and uh, for a period of four months, and then the mother returned. So that's Nemo Yusuf. And then Truth Thompson, um, he identifies as biracial, although many of his uh, classmates say, uh, think that he's Latino. This is what Truth says. Um, he has a white mother and African-American father. Um, his father used drugs extensively um, when he was younger. Both parents did, and his father eventually uh, could not look after himself and moved back to um, St. Louis to live with his own mother. Um, <coughs> Truth actually started at Jefferson High School his junior year, and by his senior year he was taking college-level classes for credit at one of the local universities. So, in looking across um, the voices and experiences of these young people, and also looking at the literature on grit and perseverance, um, what I've been putting together here is a grounded model of how students acquire these non-cognitive factors associated with academic success. And, um, uh, there, one of the things I'm trying to do here is move between, um, as, as Dr. Bartlett mentioned, individual and social levels of analysis, all right? So you can see in the beginning here at the top, 
Um, the sense of belonging a young person has to a school community, a classroom community, is extremely important, foundationally important. Um, and part of this, if you look at that second line, is a school cultural emphasis on student capabilities, on young people's capabilities, right? So when you see that word capabilities, we're probably all thinking about assets, right? Strength-based approaches. And this is just crucial to um, young people developing beliefs in their own abilities. And uh, you know, one of the things I talk about with school leaders and courses I teach with them is if you're starting a school, this would seem to be the, the cornerstone, right? You want your staff members and your colleagues to have those shared beliefs <coughs> and the capabilities of young people. Um, so to, to, uh, teacher-student relationships, um, students also creating a sense of belonging with uh, like-minded peers. We'll talk more about this. There's also a literature on the importance of young people discovering interests or sparks um, that they can then develop that give them a sense of purpose. Uh, very important also. We're going to talk more in a little bit on the importance of future orientation as a gateway asset. And then the, um, the components that I've got in our italics here seem to be those components that are specifically oriented towards developing a sense of neoliberal agency. Okay, so uh, not just imagining a future, but imagining future self-value, all right? Imagining value on markets, we'll talk about that, uh, and raising self-expectations. We'll talk a bit about developing confidence. We'll also talk about this sense of developing a, a winning streak, all right? Um, and also these strategic separations from peers and family, okay? And then you can see some of the other um, non-cognitive factors that seem to be acquired by young people after some of these earlier factors have already been internalized, okay? Uh, once there's a reason, right, for developing greater self-control, this is Andrew, Angela Duckworth here on the mental contrasting, realizing that hard work and effort pay off, learning from mistakes and failure, uh, and of course, developing an academic mindset. So that's where we're going. Now certainly many of these young people were motivated by trying to uh, attain um, a better living for themselves and their families, for their parents, trying to emerge from uh, cycles of poverty. And so here is a Southeast Asian female student um, who I thought was very, very articulate about this, right? And so she said, you know, the really honest answer is she wanted a better life for her family, okay, even though it sounds cliche. Cliche, and she talks about a cycle here that low peop, low income people go through, um, get caught in this cycle. It's hard to get out. It's even hard to see that you're in this cycle. She says, right? Um, uh, so people that are low income in this area, um, raised with hot dogs, get caught in this cycle. Don't think that there's very many opportunities. She says that if she hadn't realized that there were opportunities, she may have just gone to a community college. She says, which isn't bad. Um, but she wouldn't realize that there would have been other options, okay? And it's these other options that we're going to be talking about, and especially how these young people became aware that there were other options, okay? So let's talk about future orientation, which the literature says is a gateway non-cognitive asset, a gateway non-cognitive asset. In other words, young people need, seem to need to acquire this before other non-cognitive assets or character skills will be uh, adopted. So here is an African American senior who says that he had struggled with knowing who he was. Um, and once he began to figure it out, who he was, um, he figured out who, quote, I need to be. And that's when I started doing work. That's when I figured out who, who I want to be, who I am myself. So just doing the work and having that goal, seeing that brought out more of the inner me. So again, being able to think about the future. And so very, very important, I think, how this draws on young people's imaginations, you know, and one of the best writers I've come across on the important, the, the power of imagination uh, is Arjuna Potterai. And so very, very important on imagination here and the creative powers of young people. And so here's how Pajau talked about this, all right? So she talked about um, the struggles that she endured and the ridicule that she endured during her pregnancy um, at the top. And then after she had her daughter, um, she actually felt that she might give up Okay, but there was a part of her, she said, that said uh, in, inside her, don't give up yet. Uh, there's still hope for you, don't give up yet. Um, she says she came to the conclusion that her daughter was her hope. Um, 
and she's been keeping her going. She's just a blessing to her, so I'm glad I had her. And then at the end, uh, she kind of made me realize that I need to set my priorities straight and just go on with life because it's not the end. It's actually a new opportunity for me to take, okay? Um, so if people said that having a daughter as a, fresh, uh, as a freshman in high school ended her life, she would say, I have to dis just disagree because I felt like she opened me up to the real world and she allowed me to, to mold myself into the person that I wanted to be. So molding herself, and there's, there's many different interpretations that we could make of a, of a phrase like that, but part of this is, um, uh, is, is taking on, from in the Foucault, Foucaultian sense, um, needing to take on a sense of self-discipline, right? Um, and disciplining the self. Foucault would also refer to some of these things that we'll talk about as techniques of the self as well. So that's what Pajau mentioned. So when I talked with Nemo about how she had uh, begun to think about college and getting on a college-going pathway, the one person that she mentioned in the school was the same person that Truth Thompson mentioned. Um, and his name was Sam Fitzpatrick. These are all pseudonyms. And he was the director of the school's College and Career Center. All right? Uh, and I'll tell you about him in a minute. This is what she said. Nemo said, I always mention him. He's gone above and beyond every single time. He works so hard, and I've seen it, especially for me, and I really can't repay him enough. He always says I'm brilliant. He always makes me feel better about myself, and I really like that. I know he's not just saying that. He truly means it. He sees something in me that I sometimes forget to see potential to succeed and to overcome things. So here, she's talking, in, in a sense, about this uh, particular adult's ability to see her future for her, to see her future potential for her. And that seems so important um, for these young people in terms of uh, adopting these non-cognitive factors. So I want to tell you a little bit about this very interesting person, the director of the College and Career Center. So this College and Career Center was actually the largest center of its kind in the state, all right? Um, and it had all kinds of um, uh, notable achievements um, as a center um, in trying to um, move young people onto a college-going pathway as well as a pathway that could yield, uh, that could lead to a productive career. Um, and when I first sat down with him, I was checking in with him, I'd gotten to know him for a couple of years, and then we sat down in the fall of 2014. And he showed me two texts on his phone. Um, one was from a uh, uh, an African, uh, Asian American female student who was standing in front of the admissions office at Carleton College and the text read, I'm here, the head of financial aid knew me by name, I've made it this far because of you. Uh, another from an Asian American female student who was standing in front of the main hall at Brown University, her text read, quote, thanks for getting me here, I couldn't have done it without you. So this person seemed to have a very strong influence on the trajectories of these young people. Um, and they did this in a couple of ways. They had a comprehensive career uh, and college curriculum for all students in the school. They called this their comprehensive uh, uh, curriculum. He also had a study group taking a, roughly the, the top eight to 10 students in a class, and they would sign up for this with him, and trying to improve their chances of being admitted to selective colleges and receiving um, substantial financial aid packages from selective colleges. That was called study group. But then he also was just kind of on call for students um, in helping them put together their essays and their college admissions <coughs> applications. Um, and a lot of that could stretch through the December holidays into January. And he spent a huge amount of time in his office in the school over the December holidays, um, often with students, including uh, graduates of the school that perhaps needed to transfer from a college that hadn't worked out very well. So this person had an extraordinary commitment to these young people and I really wanted to understand um, where his commitment came from, his beliefs about students and how he was able to get their attention and have such a strong impact on them. And so a few things that I learned, um, these are quotes from Sam Fitzpatrick, the director of the College and Career Center. Um, he was very concerned about the criticism and the negativity uh, in these young people's lives, right? And so he said that what he'd really like to do is try to be able to reprogram young people's thinkings, thinking about their futures. 
Um, when a student has something go their way, they're just expecting it to be taken away, all right? Uh, and this can get in the way of their outcomes. And then he said, and this term came up several times, I'm trying to develop ways that can help begin or maintain winning streaks, all right? So hang on to that, uh, that term winning streaks because we're going to get into that in just a minute. But I do want to just share a couple of things that he said that, uh, that he did and that he said he was concerned with um, in terms of emphasizing in his classes. And one of, the, um, one of the things that I noticed when I went, first went to one of his large comprehensive classes, um, that even this, this was classes of about 30 uh, freshmen that were rotating through uh, the College and Career Center. They're all sitting at computer terminals. They use Naviance. Some of you might have heard of Naviance. And I go in, and this guy, Mr. Fitzpatrick, he's a very tall white guy. He used to play uh, basketball. He's from California. And he's, this is how he's teaching. Okay? He's standing on a chair. All right? And there are students in front of him. All right? And he said, he explained to me, that what he's really interested in is bang for the buck. Right? He's interested in getting students' attention. This is one of the ways that he gets students' attention. All right? So he's up on a chair. And one of the things that he did, um, this was actually with the seniors, is he would have a bowl uh, filled with um, all kinds of things, uh, office supplies, erasers, um, pen, pencil sharpeners, um, pencils, pens, all right? He would have this bowl, and he would take this bowl, whole bunch of students in the auditorium, this is a, another larger group, take the bowl, and he would throw everything in the air, all right? And they would land throughout the crowd, all right? And then he'd say, did any of you catch anything? Did any of you catch everything that was in the bowl? You didn't, did you, right? He said, that's going to be your problem if you don't get started now on your college applications. There is going to be too much for you to catch. There's going to be too much for you to take account of, all right? So that's why you have to listen carefully to us when we're trying to guide you in this process. Another thing he did, he would actually reach into his wallet, right, and take out a dollar bill, all right? Take out a dollar bill, um, and he would, I don't think he actually ever lit it on fire, Okay, but he would give it away or drop it, and he'd say, do you know why I can do this? Because I went to college, all right? Because I do have money, all right? So he had all these different ways of getting students' attention, all right? Another thing that he did um, with ninth graders that I thought was especially important was he would talk to them about um, skills that they had. All right, and he said, I'm always trying to find ways to, to hook people in. And he would say to these ninth graders, imagine we're a group of ninth graders in a class, maybe 30 ninth graders, he would say, what are you good at? What are you good at? And he would find that rarely would anyone say anything. All right, but then he would prompt them. All right, and he'd say, um, how many of you speak another language? Well, and then some hands start to go up. All right, he'd say, how many of you know how to take care of other people? Like older relatives or younger siblings? More hands go up, right? Um, how many of you know computer programs or software? More hands go up. So he seemed to be taking some of the responsibilities of some of these uh, lower income students um, on the east side um, and helping them to imagine that they're actually marketable skills, right? Um, and this is part of what I think is going on here as far as helping them to imagine uh, future selves with marketable value, all right? And so I think this is very, very important for us to understand as far as um, an approach that a person in a school had to encouraging young people to think about their future. I'm going to get down, all right? <laughs> but let me show you something else. When I heard that term winning streaks, okay, when he says that I'm in the business of trying to um, get young people to start and maintain winning streaks, um, for me that takes me back to the earlier study that I did in Ohio. And it takes me actually back to a very specific uh, interview that I did with the athletic director of the school. All right? And I'd asked this athletic director, um, how important is it to parents in this community that their children are on winning athletic teams? All right? And see what she said. All right. She said that she thought it was important for these young people to just feel what it was like to win. All right. 
and she said that uh, this can result in this kind of this sense that, you know, this little natural arrogance that comes with it. And uh, the kids can do some incredible things when they have this confidence, this sauce, right, this trust in their teammates to be able to win. So I think there's something about feeling like a winner that's very important to developing a sense of, the sense of confidence that um, is likely a part of neoliberal agency, right? So that's where that takes me. A couple other things. Um, as far as imagining future self-value, this could create dilemmas uh, for, for young people. And um, so this is what Truth was actually talking about when I asked him about uh, the future. And um, he saw different kinds of future for himself. When he started school, he hadn't really thought, and even his junior year, he hadn't really thought about going to college. And then by his senior year, not only is he taking uh, courses for college credit at a local college, but he's also beginning to get financial aid offers from selective co colleges across the United States. So here's what he was thinking about. He, he actually um, had been quite set on tattooing and a career in tattooing. He was an extraordinary artist. Um, but he's also been thinking more recently about things like character design and graphic design uh, for movies. So he's been thinking about these different things, um, but this is posing some dilemmas for him. And when I asked him about obstacles or challenges that could get in the way, um, he talks about how in tattooing you need to do a pr an apprenticeship, all right? you, generally an unpaid apprenticeship for several years. And he says here that um, that might be kind of tough coming right out of college okay, to do an unpaid apprenticeship. right? Um, and so that's where it's kind of difficult for me, he says in the middle, I've got just been, you know, thinking about that, but it's just kind of something that I just want to see where it goes, um, because, you know, internships, you know, at like a place like Disney or something would be great, Disney is something I have to, you know, it's a huge inspiration, he loves that, and just their whole style of art is like magical. So here he's talking about two um, quite different uh, aspirations that are rooted in different parts of his life, and the tattooing comes out in an earlier part of his life, um, but he realizes that that may not be as practical um, or as appealing as he, when he comes out of college. A couple other things, um, and this is really the, the last category I want to share with you um, that seems to have something to do with the development of neoliberal agency, uh, and Stacy and I were talking about this this morning in terms of uh, strategic separations and individuating from certain kinds of groups, okay? And so this is Truth talking about um, uh, changing groups of friends and associates when he was in middle school and high school, all right? Um, and the, the prompting question here was, um, have you found over time that you had to learn in high school who your real friends are? And he said yes, and this is what he talked about, all right? He said that his earlier group of friends, um, one of them, a very good friend, ended up dropping out of school. Um, they used to be really good friends, but then there was an influence that was not good for me to have, all right? And that's why I just kind of got myself away from that uh, and just really focusing on me. I don't really even talk to them anymore, which really sucks because they're like the only friends left from my childhood, all right? Um, but now, that was a lot of wasting time, and now I would not be sitting in the position that I am right now if he had continued uh, to have those associations, all right? Um, so that's one kind of strategic separation. Another kind of strategic separation um, seemed to primarily involve um, female students. And what I'm thinking about here is in part informed by Cindy Katz's work on neoliberalism. Um, and one of the things that she has pointed out is with the withdrawal of public support for uh, the costs of social reproduction of households, much of those costs end up being taken up by uh, women and older children, all right? And I think that's a very, very important aspect of neoliberalization. And so here is Nemo, who talked about the importance of living um, not in her parents' home once she went to college. And Sam Fitzpatrick, the director of the CCC, um, mentioned repeatedly that he knew about female students who were very capable students and had all kinds of possibilities in front of them for college. Um, but were drowning, and that was his word, drowning in responsibilities at home. Uh, some students who would be going to college fairly close to home and would be expected to come home on the weekends and do more or less full-time care for older relatives on the weekends. And he was very worried about the prospects of these young students, these female students, succeeding in college, all right? And so Nemo um, had been admitted 
uh, to the local university and said that she really wanted to be living on campus, all right? Um, and she wants to make sure that happens, right? Um, so I can focus and succeed. I love my family so much, but I feel like if I stay at home, nothing will really work for me, you know? And I'm doing it so that, you know, for their sake and for mine too, I just feel like I need to leave. And so this is another important dilemma that a lot of these young people uh, face. So a few things just to wrap up. Um, one of the things that I think so many of these non-cognitive factors need to be oriented to in a neoliberal area is enhancing the ability of these young people to compete. To compete uh, in an era, in a future characterized by risk and uncertainty. Um, and so I've tried to show some of these pathways and also there's, there's a bit of an intersectional analysis here too. Okay, happy to talk about that more. So you can see um, uh, Pajau, Pajau's situation here um, as a teenage mother and daughter of immigrant parents um, being woken up to what she referred to as the real world and what she would need to do to provide for her daughter there. Um, truth being caught between these different aspirations uh, to be a tattoo artist uh, and more sophisticated ideas about graphic design. Um, Nemo's life being shaped by globalization really um, and the fact that she'd endured this horrific trauma in East Africa uh, and then been responsibilized uh, by her family um, when her mother ran away. Um, and a couple of last things. Um, I do think that it's so important for us to understand um, and not to underemphasize um, how these young people uh, seem to, to uh, feel like they need to think about themselves as people with market value in the future. Um, and not just that, but really to begin to feel like and to conduct themselves as, um, as winners. And I think that's a big part of the, the confidence that many of them are beginning to take on. And you know, my previous work in suburban Ohio, one of the things I mentioned at the, the beginning here is how these young people were surrounded by a whole cultural system, sociocultural system that was oriented towards um, personal advancement. But here in this setting, um, these people didn't have any kind of surround um, uh, in terms of the intensity of these positive influences on them. And, um, there were other responsibilities and influence that actually seemed to work against um, their own um, success as individuals. And so their efforts seemed to be then more solitary, cultivated by a smaller number of adults, creative, dedicated adults. Um, so it seemed more crucial for many of these influence to have more impact and more power uh, to them. And I think that's one of the reasons why we saw um, Mr. Fitzpatrick up on the chair trying to get bang for the buck for his efforts. Um, but the most potent of these influences seemed to be the ones that worked on these young people's imaginations. Uh, and that seemed to be very, very important in terms of helping them imagine themselves um, in the future, their possible selves in the future uh, with regard to mainstream success. But there were also dilemmas here um, and costs with, re with regard to um, cutting ties or modifying ties uh, with friends and with families. So happy to talk more about this if you have any questions. Thanks. I have a question. Sure. <coughs> Can you talk, do you, so do you see the concept of psychological capital as a measure of neoliberal agency? In other words, the way I've seen I'm super interested in this because the way I've seen ideas, sort of psychological measures used is to, so like I, I'm thinking of like the possible selves literature, right? Mm. Like Daphne Oyserman's work. And, mm -hmm. and often that's used as a way to kind of measure students' readiness for something or, you know, so I guess I'm, I don't, I'm trying to, I'm trying to puzzle through the relationship between psychological capital and neoliberal agency and what you see as that, as that relationship. Yeah, I like that question. And I think that I haven't, I haven't, I have not treated them as measures. I have not seen them treated as measures um, as such. I, th I see them as adaptations uh, to the dictates of a neoliberal era. Um, that's primarily the way I see them. And I think it would be very interesting to um, to investigate the, the extent to which they could be operationalized um, and measured. 
provided that uh, the measures could be adapted to different contexts. You know, I think that's really important as well. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. So I was wondering, um, with your with cutting ties with the family, right, and, and modifying their relationships, did the students talk? And, and you know, this might not be in what, in what you've written, it, so just don't answer it. Okay. Uh, uh, but so, how did the students talk about their families? Did they did they start to impose these uh, ideas or imaginations onto them, or did how did could I, I feel like we often talk about them, or the, or the work that I've seen, right? It, it's often in positive light. So strategy, things that come out of their family that are helpful, but they're struggling with imposing these neoliberal ideas onto their family while still looking for something that is there, if that makes sense. So I was wondering if you came across any of that in, in your interviews, or how they engage with their family. Or what, what were they drawing from those relationships that they felt they had to cut and modify? Yeah, so I think that, um, and I'm still trying to make sense of um, that portion of the data corpus as well. And I think that, you know, in general, you can see it in Nemo too. I mean, she feels a very strong sense of connection to and responsibility for her family. And even when her mother um, had run away for a period of four months, at one point, and uh, her grandmother gave her some money to buy some gifts for her <laughs> younger siblings. And she bought these gifts and she gave them to the siblings and she told the siblings that these things were actually from her mother, right? Um, and so I think that, you know, there, there are, there's this sense of strong ties, um, but there's also a sense of what they need to do as individuals um, in order to um, further their education, um, in order to further their ambitions, some of which might have to do with providing for their own families in the future. And so Pajau actually wanted to um, go to college um, and succeed in part so she could um, establish a nonprofit for teenage mothers and supporting them. So it's, it's very complex in terms of the motivations, you know, and I'm still working through that. Um, do you have any other advice for directions that I ought to take that in terms wow. of interpretation? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, yeah, that, that's what interests me is yeah. that it's so, there's so much going on there. Yes. Do you find this deeply troubling? Yeah. I find this very upsetting. Yeah. yeah. And it's especially the, the kind of dissolution dimension of this, you know, and the, um, what you see happening to, you know, solidarities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and what they bring, what the students bring is only recognized if it's assimilated into a particular way of being or futurizing or presenting self. It's not really the big culture we Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. And what strikes me, too, is that another cost is accommodating to a, mo to a very individualized model. Like, one of the questions I had early on, uh, when you had that slide that talked about kind of the literature discussion of grit, you italicized elements that aren't mm -hmm. really discussed in that model, um, was, is there a more social version of grit? Does it have mm -hmm. to be neoliberal? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure there could be. I mean, I, actually, that, I'm not, that's not true. I think there could be in another situation. But I th think, in general, it's not consistent with the model of personal advancement that most American high schools adopt. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a cost, like mm -hmm. accommodating to that idea that that in order to be successful, it, it requires adopting a very individualist, individualistic model mm -hmm. of advancement, mm -hmm. um, which Pichau has modified to some extent mm -hmm. right, by having a, a larger social uh, mission right. to her. But how durable will those ties be, right? And so that speaks to the importance of the kind of longitudinal work that you do. You know, I, that's a real question. Yeah, let me just get a pen. I can't, I gotta write down some of these things that you're saying. Yeah, please. Uh, thinking about also the costs of the ways they're accommodating to the individualized narrative in terms of, like, that we know that these students 
are less likely to be successful in college. Yeah. So then once they've kind of shifted their psychological narrative to this individualized, like you're responsible for your own success, once, when the winning streak is broken, um, what does that mean for their own, how they make sense of what, what their, their life narrative is then, right? Mm. Or, mm -hmm. I, it just what might be the unintended consequences, I think, of mm -hmm. some of the mm -hmm. ways that the Mr. Fitzpatrick's framing mm -hmm. of what their potential life courses could be, could it end up, I, it just makes me wonder, like, could they end up in a worse place um, for being more successful in this moment? And, and, and at the same time, I don't want to take away their opportunity for agency right. to do something. I mean, if this is the field and this is how you play, I don't want to say that they should be uh, you know, a communal culture because that's what I think their culture should be. So I don't want to take away their opportunity. And certainly, you know, in academia, we can't throw any stones because we're certainly accommodating to a competitive, individualistic structure when we sit here in this room. So, you know, who am I to say what? So it's, I think it's a really fascinating juxtaposition of stuff. And I think that's assuming that there actually is agency happening in the neoliberal agency is that, you know, I don't know, I don't like agency. Um, <laughs> but so thank you, that um, sorry to get in this question. <laughs> Um, so the link, so the link between understanding and practices, their their imagination of, of what's happening and participating yeah. in neoliberal agency, right? But the actual practices that then come out, right? So the practices of cutting off, but also the practice that you said, Pajal, uh, uh, mm -hmm. where she bought these uh, gifts and then said it was for her uh, from their mother, right? Yeah, Nemo, yes. Nemo, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, that's a different. That's a practice. Yes. That's a different practice. Right. Yes, it is. So there's an imagination. Yes. That they're participating in, but the practices are uh, different, right? Mm -hmm. And so that that's one thing that I'm trying to work through right now is the practices don't always align with these imaginations, right? So I'm right. really into like subaltern logics, and so right. what what you know, I don't know if you have anything. Well, yeah, and that's a, That's the use of a, the imagination to try to solidify ties within a family, right, in some ways, and to reassure her four siblings and four half-siblings of their, their mother's love and continued support even in her, access, in, in her absence. And I, I agree. I mean, that's another way that the imagination is being drawn upon here. So it's not always, of course, you know, for more individualistic prospects, right? So yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. One of the things that Dr. Lee and I were talking about this morning is how, and I know that, that you're concerned about this and your data is showing this, is how immigrant communities themselves are stratifying, you know. And so what does that mean for um, the social support of individuals um, and what, what you refer to as other individuals and groups becoming more hyper-invisibilized, right, as well? Yeah. Something that's really interesting to me about the story of the tattoo artist is that tattooing, right, is sort of a hyper-capitalist art form in the sense that really, you know, that's not art for art's sake in the way that in a liberal arts education we might talk about, like, art making and, and opening up possibilities and, right, tattooing is very, is a very... Capitalist, man one could argue that tattooing is a capitalist manifestation of an art form, right? Because you are, someone is giving you money to put their, their art on their body. Mm. Um, and so I, I'm interested in kind of, it's just, it was an interesting story to me relative to college going as sort of an acquiescence to this kind of, maybe to neoliberal agency, but actually, but, but seemed to me kind of in terms of the disciplinary learning mm -hmm. to actually be a shift away <coughs> from thinking about I make art so that I can tattoo people and make money versus mm -hmm. I make art because mm -hmm. I have this sort of interest in, I'm inspired by this and I have an interest in becoming better at this mm -hmm. and maybe that will mean mm -hmm. that I do something else mm -hmm. with my life. 
Um, so that I just it was interesting to me to, to the, the sort of potential. I don't know. I don't have any good words for it, but it was just interesting to me because tattooing strikes me as this very. And different statuses of kinds of art, right? I mean, becoming if he if he was to actually be, be able to be able to become a graphic artist for Disney, that would bring with it a whole different set of possibilities, as well. But once again, people are purchasing tickets to go see a film, and I appreciate that. Yeah, behind. Yeah. Um, I guess that kind of taps into something that I'm curious about, which is um, what is maybe neoliberal specifically about some of these. Um, trends that you're seeing or themes. For example, it seems like the idea of separation from family for working class kids who are successful is kind of a, a long one in some of the literature on class. Mm -hmm. I think of that movie, I don't know, I think it was called The Class or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, it was like a PBS documentary, and that was you know, like a certain a theme. Certainly with immigrant families, there's always this theme of like separation from family in terms of assimilating into the dominant culture. Um, and then it seems like wouldn't working class youth always be concerned about the jobs they have based on their economic circumstances? <laughs> I mean, so to be market oriented, I don't know if we would call that market oriented or survival oriented or what, but this is kind of going to your question there. Is that to be oriented in that way, if you are somebody who needs to figure out how to put money on the table, is that neoliberalism or is that something else? Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate that. And I've, I've been wrestling with that too. You know, So what is it um, that makes this era different um, and distinctive? And certainly there are these long historical legs, right? And these long um, historical patterns you know that that go back to you know American individualism and the kind of literature that you're talking about you know there's no doubt about that you know but I think that part of this is you know that earlier quote from um, one of the Asian American female students who was talking about this cycle you know and she was talking about how unlikely it seemed to be from her perspective to be able to get out of that cycle you know and, and I do think that the neoliberal regime, and this is what the data bears out too, is it is harder, you know, it's harder, it's possible, but it's harder, you know. And so that's where I think that, you know, this importance of thinking about yourself as a winner, as, as not only being able to um, do certain things, but even being somewhat lucky in a way, you know. And, and that's where I think some of the ephemera kind of comes in here in terms of how these young people think about themselves as, really as agents, you know, as people that can do things and make things happen and overcome um, some of the structural difficulties. But no, I agree. I mean, to me that, you know, be really honest, that, that is a question that I, I think about quite a lot, you know, and, um, you know, and, and thinking about what does make this era slightly different, you know, what does make um, these young people um, slightly different in terms, especially in terms of the young people that are able to um, move on out of the east side, you know, into these different futures. So, yeah, I appreciate other ideas you would have on that, too. But I heard, I heard another question, too, or maybe I'm reading it into your question, but I, I think you're referring not, on to, not only to the historical era, but in, in some ways it's the question of, well, which is the more neoliberal self? Mm -hmm. Is it the one who, who is a tattoo artist or the Disney graphic mm -hmm. designer? Mm -hmm. And how are we defining what constitutes a, a neoliberal self mm -hmm. yeah. in thinking about that? And, and which practices count? Like, in some ways, anybody who uses Facebook or Twitter is really thinking about packaging the self and pr promotion of the self and the self mm -hmm. as brand mm -hmm. in some way. That's, uh, that's an aside. But so like which practices do we look at? Is it only practices at school or in the home or in the community or with peers? Or uh, I know you've thought about all these things, but that's what your question raised for me. In relation to the neoliberal framework, one point about neoliberalism is uh, it's not to just destroy the, the people's imagination on the one hand. Another thing is it remake 
the subject, especially for the notion you mentioned the cause, this um, the notion of self. I was thinking how about the conceptual governance, you know. Yes. Um, using this concept to interpret your data for on the one hand how they have to accommodate themselves, adopt some uh, practice for their um, reali realistic reasons. For another hand, how this practice and process remake uh, the identities. Mm -hmm. And what kind of people this process and the practice imagination shaped what kind of people they will become. For example, folks talk about uh, um, individual self and for, um, these three uh, these three focus students, some of them have their immigrant background, how their how the transnational experience was shaped and influenced by by their schooling or educational experience in American schools. Mm. So I was thinking you also mentioned like globalization play out in, in these students uh, um, you know uh, school experience. So I think my main point is uh, on the one hand they have to uh, adopt some uh, some practice mm -hmm. and on the other hand they will remain by this uh, what they are doing. Mm -hmm. So there is a cause notion about it. And, and what we call talk about neoliberalism may perhaps maybe help to interpret the data. Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, uh, there was a panel that I was on recently where the discussion um, certainly mentioned the importance of using the theory of governmentality mm -hmm. um, more explicitly mm -hmm. to understand uh, the voices and experiences of these young people. So I think that's something that I do need to look at. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Any other? I, I oh. Actually, I have another <coughs> yeah, comment. Yeah, please. Because I was thinking, like your current project, uh, how the current project linked with your earlier yeah. work. It, it seems to me like uh, you definitely, um, these two projects uh, can make a good comparison. You know, how their uh, production, a reproduction advantage on uh, uh, your early work, mm -hmm. and how their um, production of this, uh, this uh, low income student, how their school, the role of the school in making difference on this uh, student. Yes. Perhaps maybe your future article can <laughs> definitely use this two set of data yeah. to make uh, this two project more meaningful for, for well, the, how, how their um, new in your uh, larger context in a local, na national, global level impact uh, these two different advantage and disadvantage mm -hmm. population, how mm -hmm. the role of the, the school and the leadership of the personal director of the career center. No? Mm -hmm. So I feel like uh, that is, I, I see your, your, your research trajectory. So on that part, so it will make a big difference for the, for the area. I appreciate that. Yeah, one of the things that there is a bit of a time problem. I started the data collection for that other study in 1999, you know, but I think some of the landscape was beginning to change, going back to, you know, what really does constitute a neoliberal era, like you were saying. So I think I would have that challenge, but I think that, you know, as an anthropologist of education, I'm interested in robust patterns over time, and I think that there could be some. Uh, some important comparisons to make. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Any final questions or comments? No? Well, thank you so much. We're really glad. Thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs>